Welcome to Hunting Asynchronous Vulnerabilities. You may find it concerning that as you browse the web, every fragment of information that your browser gives off is instantly fed into scores of back-end system for advertising and tracking, where this data is mined, processed, and mangled for all it's worth. Or you may think that that's some serious attack surface. If only I had a way to harness it. In this session, I'll share with you a range of techniques for mining invisible attack surfaces and finding vulnerabilities regardless of where they're hiding. Around 18 months ago, I was asked to pen test an e-commerce website that sold designer clothes. And there was a staging version of this website, but it was completely broken, so I had to test the live version. And this meant that I had to use my own valid credit card details in order to do purchases. And as a result, I was being extremely careful not to accidentally purchase, say, a thousand pound leather jacket for myself. And after spending the first morning testing and not really getting anywhere, I went out for lunch. And when I got back from lunch, I found I had an email. It said, Dear James, congratulations on your order of this fine thousand pound leather jacket. And I panicked slightly. But then, thinking about it, I couldn't have actually paid for this jacket because at this point, I hadn't entered any credit card details whatsoever. So actually, I found quite a serious vulnerability. It was possible to buy items for free. The only catch was, I had no idea what had triggered this vulnerability. I had no idea what had caused it, and the client probably wasn't going to appreciate me going, hey there, you've got a critical vulnerability, but I can't tell you how to replicate it or how to fix it. <laughs> it was only after three hours of reviewing my burp suite logs that I figured out what the cause was, which was simply a session handling uh, issue. I had added this item to my basket during the morning of testing, and the scanner that had been running over lunchtime had replayed a particular request which had bought this item. So that was cool, and I told the client, and they were fairly happy. But it left me wondering, what would have happened if there was no order confirmation email? Some random stranger would have got a leather jacket, but I would have never found the vulnerability. In effect, this email was a callback from the application to, to me, to my mail server, to let, me though, to let me know that it had a critical vulnerability. And these instances of vulnerabilities that happen behind the scenes that don't present immediate evidence like directly at you, that can happen with plenty of other vulnerabilities. That isn't just limited to session handling. So what I'll be talking about is I'll, I'll be defining what these vulnerabilities are that are so hard to find and what it is that makes them difficult to identify. And then I'll be looking at some techniques for finding them and uh, applying that to some of the most well-known and widespread vulnerabilities out there. Finally, I'll be talking uh, about some of the hazards with these techniques and answering five minutes questions. <coughs> so the core problem with these vulnerabilities is that they're invisible. Com uh, compare them with your classic SQL injection vulnerability. With the most obvious SQL injection, you'll give an application a single quote, and you'll get a SQL error message back. And you go, great, that's vulnerable to SQL, in to SQL injection, and you proceed to exploit it. Some other, uh, the server might be configured not to give you SQL error messages, but you may still be able to find some SQL injections by using a payload like or one equals one, and observing the effect that has on the, on the output that you get on the website. But this technique also doesn't work with asynchronous vulnerabilities. And finally, with some of the more advanced SQL, SQL injection vulnerabilities, you can't change the output that you get, but you can tell the server to, to do something like sleep for 10 seconds, and you can time the response. But once again, for an asynchronous vulnerability, this doesn't work. What are some common examples of, uh, of where asynchronous vulnerabilities can arise? Well, probably the, mo the purest one is, of, is 
a vulnerability in a cron job that's just run maybe nightly. Say, say a cron job that does a backup of the database nightly. This cron job could be, could be vulnerable to SQL injection or shell command injection or various other things. But as the tester, you're not going to get the output of this cron job. And if you inject a time delay, you're never going to, you, you can't notice it because it's executing in a background thread. Some other issues might not be triggered in a background thread, but they might require some kind of, uh, of event. Probably the best example of this is blind cross-site scripting, where you give an application your cross-site scripting payload, and it never gets displayed to you. It's only visible to some administrator somewhere in some back end that you can't see and you don't have access to. And the admin might view that payload two weeks after your test has finished. So how do you find that kind of issue? And finally, the techniques that I'll be talking about can also be, uh, be used to identify other issues that aren't strictly asynchronous, but are still very difficult to find. For example, if say an application is, is processing your input as XML, and it's vulnerable to external XML entities. How do you find that vulnerability if the application doesn't display you the result of, of this processing? You, uh, there's no easy way with XML to cause a time delay without risking taking out the server, which you probably don't want to do. In order to find all of these issues, we need callbacks. We need something like the order confirmation email that was sent from the website to my mail server to let me know that it was vulnerable. And you, you, you might be thinking, great, well, in order to receive this callback, I need to host a publicly accessible server which exposes every network protocol in existence. How secure does that sound? Well, fortunately, almost every network protocol uses DNS. So actually, all you need to do is support DNS, is recognize DNS lookups, and then you can find SMTP injection and issues that cause servers to make UNC uh, connections to your server and SMB and so on. Another great thing about DNS for this purpose is that it's, it's rarely filtered outbound on firewalls, uh, widely used by various free letter groups, because basically if you block D DNS outbound on your firewall, things will tend to break. So people don't tend to do it. Also, if you're a Burp Suite user, you don't need to host this, this public, this server. Uh, we've got the, uh, the Burp Collaborator, which does this for you. And within the next month or two, we're planning on, uh, on releasing an API so that you can write scan checks using asynchronous payloads for your own personal use. OK, that's the core of the theory. So how do we actually, what does it look like when we apply this theory to a vulnerability class? Well, first, we need to have a look at what the problems we, we run into are. There's a reason this isn't widely done at the moment. The primary issue is that callback exploits fail hard. So we're uh, building, ex exploiting a normal vulnerability is typically an iterative process. First, you find the vulnerability and then you exploit it. Whereas if you're trying to trigger a callback, uh, unless you submit an absolutely perfect payload, no callback will happen and you'll never know that the vulnerability exists. And that means that the, the, the quality of the payload is really important. Ideally, you, uh, you want it to work in every environment that it could, that it could plausibly be executed in. For example, a shell command injection payload might be executed on Windows or Linux or who knows what. So you want something that works in all of those contexts. And similarly, if it's a blind XSS payload, you don't know where within a HTML markup it will be appearing. So I ideally, you want a polyglot payload that will work regardless of where it appears. You also don't know if your input is being filtered. So you want it to be resistant to filters. And of course, you want it to be as simple as possible, because the, the more complex it is, the more likely things are to go wrong. And if that sounds like a tall order, then yeah, it's absolutely a best effort sort of thing. Let's look at a 
a type of vulnerability where you're triggering a callback by the very nature of it. So with classic SMTP header injection, user input is placed inside an email header and by adding a new line, the user can inject extra email headers and maybe make the email get carbon copied to a different destination. And if, the, and if that's someone else's password reset email, then that's, that's quite a nice vulnerability. And I actually found that vulnerability in Mozilla Persona a while ago. But there was a catch, which was that the mail server processed the headers before my header got injected. So it would ignore me saying things like, please carbon copy me on this password reset email. In order to exploit this, I had to inject a, a reply to header and then a zip bomb. And the idea here was, I, I mean, you're probably thinking, what has a zip bomb got to do with this? The idea is that the mail server of the victim would scan the email for all viruses. They would go, whoa, there's a really well-known zip bomb on this, and they would bounce the email. And with a bit of luck, because of my reply to header, the email would get bounced back to me, and I'd have their password reset email. And the, what you've got to try and do is anticipate things going wrong like this. You've got to say, how can this exploit fail? When I've exploited this in normal cases, what's gone wrong and what measures can I take to handle that? XML is a wonderful technology. This single XML document uses six different features of XML to trigger pingbacks to remote servers. And each one of them is really quite simple. So finding XML injection, uh, f finding external XML entity related issues is really, really simple because it's, built, it's baked into the core technology. Uh, the, the, the last two payloads on that screen are particularly useful because they don't need to be placed inside the header of the XML document. And that means that you can find XML injection vulnerabilities where user input is placed inside a larger XML document. And that's a type of vulnerability that's normally really challenging to find. What about SQL injection? Well, structured query language isn't really designed with connecting to external services in mind. So there's nothing in the core spec that I could find that lets you initiate a pingback to a remote server. So what I've done instead is looked at each database and, and, and seen if I can use some database-specific features to issue this callback. And I thought I was getting nowhere with Postgre. And what I didn't, I just, I, I, I just skim read this page of the manual here. And maybe you can see the thing that I missed. This copy command, it doesn't sound very promising, right? But if you look closely, uh, you can actually use the copy command to execute arbitrary shell commands on the server. That's kind of cool. So if you inject something like that, then regardless of whether the backend system is Windows or Linux, as long as you've got admin privileges on the database, you've just found SQL injection in a completely asynchronous way. So it doesn't matter if this vulnerability happens in a background thread or on some other server than the one that you were targeting, because you just got that ping back. So that's nice. What about SQLite? SQLite, the name makes it sound like this is going to be really difficult, right? It's going to have very few features that you could possibly exploit. Well, fortunately, it's got a couple of features which work on files. And Windows has this wonderful feature uh, called UNC Paths, where basically any function that operates on a file can be made, can, can be made to access a file on a remote server over SMB. So that means that whenever you've got a file I.O. kind of thing and you've got control over the path, you can make Windows issue a pingback over DNS. Great. <clears throat> and I thought this was only exploitable on Windows until two days ago. It turns out actually OS X has, an, has a feature that's similar but even better. So here, on OS X, as you can see on the top payload, you can 
anything that takes a file path can be given slash net and then an arbitrary domain name and OS X will try to mount that as an NFS share. So that's handy if someone's uh, foolish enough to be running a web application on OS X. I think it happens sometimes. OK, what about Microsoft SQL? Well, you can use Open Rowset, but it requires a, a non-default setting. You can, require, you can use File Exist, but it requires a non-default setting. And you can use Bulk Insert From, but it requires special privileges. But what about XPO, XP Dirtree? If you execute this, it tells you you need system. It tells you this failed because you need sysadmin privileges. So it doesn't really look very promising. But if you test it and run Wireshark, you'll find that it actually did the DNS lookup to the remote server before checking whether you had the permission to execute it. So that's absolutely perfect. That means that we can quite reliably find asynchronous SQL injection against SQL server, uh, regardless of what privileges the, uh, the database user has. What about Oracle? Oracle has quite a few features. You can actually uh, write, an, uh, write a payload to find Oracle SQL injection that will send you a nicely formatted email to let you know it's found a vulnerability. Uh, however, once again, it requires privileges which in later versions of Oracle you may find you don't have. However, Oracle lets all users regardless of how, what, what privileges they have, execute its XML parsing functionality. And as we know, XML is a wonderful technology with lots of helpful features. So what NetSpy found was that Oracle's XML parsing is vulnerable to external XML entities. And that means that a, a user with no privileges can trigger a pingback. Uh, so what we're doing here is using SQL injection to tell Oracle to parse a malicious XML document to trigger an XXE vulnerability that will send a ping back to our server. Great. Uh, this issue has been patched. So if you're up against a database uh, maintained by someone who studiously apply their patches, uh, then it might not work. <coughs> what about MySQL? Well, there's load file. This is very similar to the SQLite payload. Uh, it works if you're on a system that allows remote file names. And the same with select in, uh, into out, out files. So the, the first is for reading files. The, the, the second is intended for writing files. And at this point, you might have noticed that Linux-based systems have been getting off really quite easily. And it was really beginning to annoy me quite a lot. So I thought, OK, what if? I change the rules slightly. What if I say, actually, I know I'm, I'm supposed to be like, really nice to this target system because I've got, I'm accessing it remotely or whatever, but I'm going to start writing files to the file system to try to trigger a ping back. The most obvious thing to go for is to drop a shell within the web route that issues a ping back. However, from the point of view of a burp suite scan, we don't really necessarily know where the, where the web route is. So we don't know where to write this file. So the, what we would need to do is basically spray shelves over the whole file system. Uh, and our clients might not appreciate that too much. So that's not great for our purposes. Another option that looked really promising at first is that if you write a file to, uh, to the right folder on some systems, a mailer will read in that file and email it. However, I could only get it working on, working on Microsoft Outlook, which is pretty pointless. At this point, I got even more desperate. I was like, OK, some files, you can write to them, uh, and they will result in something being printed out. So what if we write, dear employee, you have one employee of the month. Please contact james.kettle at portswigger.net to claim your price. Right? We've got a asynchronous payload that bypasses outbound network filtering. Unfortunately, the employee needs to be a bit of a muppet, and the web server needs, needs to be running as root. So that's not that great either. We don't do that with Burp Suite, just in case you were wondering. What about configuration files? So MySQL loads configuration files in a special order from the bottom up that's very, very helpful. Because 
the select into out file uh, command that MySQL has can't be used to overwrite files. You can only use it to create new files. But due to this load order that MySQL uses, you can, you can write a file to a place where one doesn't exist. And then if it's the right location, MySQL will read that in as a config file and give it priority over the config files that are likely to already exist. And there's a setting that you can set with a config file called bind address. And this defines the address that the server will try to bind to and listen on when it's booted up. And you can set that to be a host name and cause a DNS lookup. Brilliant. Unfortunately, there's a little bit of a catch with this, which is that after doing a DNS lookup, the server will try to bind to this address. So if you do a pen test and say burp injects this command, then it's entirely possible that two weeks later, when the sysadmin tries to restart the server, it will try to bind to a remote address and just crash. You can try to mitigate this by setting up your DNS server to return the IP address 0.0.0.0, .0 which will lead to it binding to all available interfaces. However, there's another catch with that, which is that the, the sysadmin might not want it to bind to all available interfaces. <clears throat> it could actually be worse than if it just crashed entirely. So that's a technique that I think you could use for manual testing in the right circumstances, but we're not using that by default. OK, that's SQL. It started out pretty easy and got quite hard at the end. What about shell command injection? Well, here we've got easy remote code ex execution, so we've got quite a bit more. F we've got quite a bit of flexibility. There's no doubt that it's easy to trigger a pingback because we've got this luxury of of it just being easy. We can try to make a a, a payload that will work in multiple different contexts. Uh, so we we want a payload that works in 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 the three main contexts on Linux and on Windows too. And the key way to build that, you could, I think you could think for a long time, or you could write a parse or something fancy, or uh, you could do what I did and just make a test bed that takes your input and executes it in each of these contexts and tells you whether it worked or not. And then you can start out with a simple payload and just kind of tweak it a bit and add bits to it and just work your way t t uh, towards, something if towards something effective. Reaching this point was quite easy. Uh, and then I ran into a little bit of a problem. So here, this payload works in every context apart from when it's inside double quotes on Windows. So we need to break out of those double quotes. But if we put a double quote in that payload, that will break out of the double quoted context on Linux, so it will then break. The way around this is to, in, is to inject an escaped double quote, because Linux supports escaping double quotes and Windows doesn't. So there, we have a single payload that will work in all of the major contexts that it's likely to be execu executed in. OK. What about blind cross-site scripting? Well, if you Google for multi-context XSS, you're going to land on a blog post by Gareth Hayes called One Vector to Rule Them All. And it looks like this. Uh, it's, it's a bit of a beast, and it undoubtedly works in a lot of contexts. But it's got some problems for our use, which is, for a start, it's quite long. If your input is being cut off after a certain length, then it's just not going to work. And it's also qu quite fragile, so any input filtering whatsoever is likely to break the entire payload. And, and in some contexts, it's requiring window.name to be, to be defined in advance which we can't always do. So we decided to make our own version that was more suited to what we wanted to do, which Gareth Hayes, who made it, is now going to come up and explain. Cheers. Can you? Um, so the idea was to produce a payload that executed in multiple contexts, um, but was small enough and used as little characters as possible um, so it bypassed any restrictions from the web app. So we start off with um, a JavaScript uh, URL context. 
um, which will, will execute in anchors. Um, then we have a closing script tag, which will break out of the script uh, context. And then the HTML context will inject an SVG. You might notice the um, opening multi-line comment in the JavaScript uh, part. That will basically um, comment out all the other contexts so that it still works in the JavaScript context. Then we have a double quoted context. Um, so if it's in a job in a JavaScript, uh, it's a single quote co uh, context, and if it will also work with a double quote. So if you're in a JavaScript string block, uh, a JavaScript string um, with a single quote or double quote, quote, it'll still work. The um, the plus will act as an infix operator, um, depending on the context that you you're in, or the concatenate operator. Um, the mouse over event is interesting because it will borrow the single and double quotes um, and break out of uh, an attribute injection. Um, so you notice the forward slash here will act as an attribute separator. Then we have an image request, which is basically used to um, create a request to the collaborator server to log that the um, event has happened. So in a blind uh, situation or an asynchronous situation, you need to send the, the, the um, request to the collaborator server in order to know that it was successful. Uh, you might notice that the image tag um, avoids spaces, um, so that is also to prevent the web application from blocking it. Um, and also, the closing comment, you might notice here, um, acts as a closing comment, obviously, um, and it's also in a regular expression character class. So it will, when executed um, using like in the double quote or a single quoted context, it will act as a regular expression. But if it, if it acts as a multi-line comment, it will um, act as an array literal and then continue the payload. So as you can see, um, we avoid uh, using two string in this instance because it's shorter to use an array literal and concatenate that instead. So it, it results in a shorter um, vector. Um, we also escape um, the docs um, because some security products will scrape the URLs, so you might get a collaborator interaction that it wasn't intending to happen. So we use the uh, escape to prevent that. Um, and then we call the replace function, um, which removes the backslashes. And um, the array literal is used as a blank string because it works in both cases. Um, and then that's the next complete. Um, we had somebody on Twitter say that this was witchcraft. When <laughs> they found uh, a blind exa, well, um, invisible XSS in uh, an internal web application. Cool. Thank you. Thanks over to James. Cool. So we've seen that you can apply asynchronous techniques to many major vulnerability classes. I also want to show that you can use it to find some pretty crazy, pretty obscure vulnerabilities that aren't generally thought of as web app vulnerabilities. For example, Say you've got an application that's called something like MediaWiki, where you can upload an attachment uh, which can have an arbitrary file name, but it has to end in .jpg. And say someone, say a sysadmin or a cron job, occasionally does something like tar star to zip up all of the images. If you upload an image with that file name, then when they execute tar star, this will be treated as arguments to tar and will trigger a pingback to our server. That's pretty cool. And there are variants of that payload for, for plenty of other common shell commands. And uh, I'm not saying that's a common vulnerability. The point here is that just there's some mental stuff that you can find using these techniques. OK, let's have a look at an actual application. You might be familiar, if you've ever been asked to do a web app test, you might be familiar with uh, landing on being asked to do a pen test of something that looks more or less like this. <laughs> right? There's, there's nothing going on there. There's nothing you can hack and you're like, well, great, maybe they're sending a cookie and they forgot to put HTTP only on it. But 
we can do better. Uh, if you pay close attention to what's going on here, uh, you'll see that there's, they're using PyWIC, which is a popular piece of analytic software, uh, which is logging your visit. And if we take this to the repeater and send it, then it looks like a pretty lame attack surface because regardless of what you send, it just says 204, no response, right? Like, what do you do with that? This is the perfect example of an asynchronous attack surface, of one where you can't see what's going on behind the scenes. So what I've done is injected three payloads. I, I've said this is analytic software. They're probably interested in what Google queries led people to, my, uh, to their site. So I'm, I'm going to fake a Google search, and I'm going to provide three malicious fake Google queries, which I've injected here. One, two, and three. So what's going to happen if someone comes along at a later date and decides to export this data as a spreadsheet? Well, you might have a clue if you were at one of the talks earlier, actually. Uh, for a start, maybe we get really lucky. OK, maybe they're using a version of LibreOffice or OpenOffice, and they're missing a couple of security patches. What's going to happen, I wonder? Well, it's pretty predictable, really. We have full control over, the, over their server, over the sysadmins personal computer, which is pretty nice. I mean, maybe in a pen test, that's not what they want to be told. Uh, but I still think it's cool. And similarly, maybe they open it in Excel, and they make the mistake. I hope the licensing works. Well, maybe they open it, and they make the mistake of reading the warning error message that comes up. This is interesting. Ah, there we go, right. <laughs> so maybe they read this, which says, do not enable this unless you trust the content of this document, unless you trust the origin of this document. And if you're a system admin, you might think, well, this document, this document came from my PyWork server. It's going to be completely trustworthy. So you're going to click through both the warnings that say the same thing, and I've got a shell again. Maybe they're a bit paranoid. Maybe they don't click except to either of those. Well, if they click on the wrong cell, then actually uh, a browser is going to pop open, which is going to leak the contents of the spreadsheet, or some of it, to my server. I've also, just last week, found a different payload, which will cause the contents of the spreadsheet to be exfiltrated to a remote server on fully patched Excel with no warnings or any kind of visual display whatsoever. Uh, I, I was hoping to, de to demo it here, but unfortunately, it's limited in the amount of data that it can get out, which makes it slightly late. But watch out for that. I hope to get that fully working and release it soon. And hopefully, Microsoft are going to say that's a feature, and then it's never going to get patched. OK. I've just shown a few examples. There are loads of things that I haven't looked at, but I'm pretty sure would be easy to detect using these techniques, like HTTP proxy, image tragic, uh, this thing I just invented a couple of days ago called remote local file include, which is local file include on a Mac, uh, and J JNDI injection, which was uh, mentioned at Blackout Vegas. What goes wrong? Well, one thing to watch out for is friendly, friendly fire. If you inject some kind of CSV payload and you get a meterpreter shell back from one of your coworkers who's also on the pen test, that, OK, that is kind of cool. But have you really achieved anything? What's the client going to think? Right. Another problem that we have encountered uh, a lot more than we thought we would with Burp Suite is, that, as Gareth briefly mentioned, quite a few security appliances scrape 
all HTTP requests for domain names. And then they send requests to those domain names to figure out whether there's an APT lurking there or something. And this means you, you might submit some really great payload for Oracle SQL injection, and then some kind of WAF will send a ping back. And you'll think the application is vulnerable to SQL injection when actually it's just vulnerable to having a slightly dubious WAF, maybe. So in order to try to mitigate that, uh, generally, we always try to escape the payloads that we send in in a way that means that for something that's doing a naive grep, it, 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 will, it won't see any valid domain names, but the payload will still work. Or if you're executing something like NSLOOKUP, you can tell NSLOOKUP, do a DNS query of this specific type, and then you can say, OK, we, for us to actually report a vulnerability, we need that exact type of DNS query to come in. Another issue that I, I briefly touched on is that asynchronous payloads have no concept of scope. So they will find vulnerabilities on systems that you were never asked to test six months after you were asked to test something completely different. It's just something to watch out for. OK, three key, t three key takeaways are you can do this. There's nothing that hard about any of this, especially if you use this server that we're hosting for you. If you, if you don't trust us, you can host it yourself. You can also do most of this manually just by setting up a DNS server and using some open source software to see what queries you get. The key thing to watch out for is that asynchronous exploits fail silently. You need to come up with a perfect payload on your first time, so you have to do your research at the start. Ultimately, just because you can't see it doesn't mean you can't hack it. I'm going to take five minutes of questions now. If you've got any questions after that, you can email me or come and talk to me at the back. Don't forget to follow me on Twitter. Thank you for listening. OK, any questions? Yep. OK, yeah. How am I handling DNS caching? What Burp Suite does uh, is we generate a random and unique subdomain every time that we send a, a payload. So we've got wildcard DNS pointing to our server, and we never reuse payloads. Anyone else? Yep. What do you think is the blind process scripting is another form of asynchronous thought process scripting? Is there any serious difference between thought process scripting and blind process scripting? Uh, uh, blind cross-site scripting is a subtype of stored cross-site scripting. That's just particularly difficult to find. Because if you cause an, an alert pop-up on some back-end system, you're probably never going to know that happened. I think it's quite common. That's the impression that we've got since we've released this check. Anyone else? Yep. Have you tried anything with um, Mongo databases or Node.js? I have not tried Mongo or Node. No. Uh, it would be interesting to see how easy it is. Yep. Uh, yeah. Very interesting example. Um, you mentioned that it was bounced because you included a uh, zip bomb. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which SMTP servers would detect that? Is it just antivirus products installed on the uh, So or? when I demo that, that was using Gmail. Using Gmail. Uh, so Gmail scans the emails for, for viruses. Yeah, but would pick this up on Microsoft Exchange. So I, I think the, uh, the file that I uh, attached is 42.zip. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but it's very, very well known. Any antivirus in existence is going to detect it, and it's probably going to reject it, because if it tries to unpack it to scan it, then it will crash, uh, because it expands to be like 70 terabytes or something. OK, cool, great, thank you.